Good afternoon. Hello. My name is Cece Gassner. I'm a proud member of the Junior League of Boise, Idaho. And I'll, thank you. And also a member of the AGLI Board of Directors. If you could please take your seats, we'd really appreciate it. We're going to get going with our speaker this afternoon. As I introduce our keynote speaker for this year's annual conference, one thing that comes to mind is a photograph that I'm sure many of us have seen that's really become part of the iconography of American history. If you look on the right-hand side of that photo, you'll see a young woman getting ready to go to high school for the first time that first day of school. She's wearing a green dress. Her shoulders are back. Her chin is up, like so many of our mothers taught us. And she's ready to go in with her friends. But there's another side to that photograph that you'll see if you look on the left-hand side of the photo. You'll see a blurred photo of a soldier, his eyes dark and hooded, looking out from underneath his helmet. And he's not looking at the young woman. He's kind of looking past her. And he's watching and observing. He's clearly there to protect her. And if you were the photographer taking that photo and you took a step back and you turned around to see what that soldier was observing, you would see a pretty angry mob. And you would hear the angry, bigoted shouts and the cat calls and the different taunts that they shouted out and that all of this anger was focused on children solely because of the color of their skin. You know, 1957 should have been a year of celebration for the United States, a real year of unity. But instead, we saw the opposite. We saw what fear looks like when it drives people, a fear not of a person or of a belief or of a way of life, but just a fear of change. And I'd venture that all of, in this, all of us in this room at some point have faced adversity and challenges. But luckily, few of us have experienced what our guest, Carlotta Walls Lanier, came up against as an African-American teen in the South in 1957. Where many of us have fond memories, our first day of school and our brand new outfits and surrounded by friends going in to meet our new teachers, Carlotta's ascent up those steps was in the company of soldiers the 101st Airborne Division that was brought in by President Eisenhower to protect them and to defend them from this angry mob. They were angry that blacks and whites might finally sit together in the same room and learn. Those brave teenagers would later be known as the Little Rock Nine. They would come to represent the deep struggles faced by African Americans across the United States and serve as a symbol of strength for the civil rights movement. As an adult, Carlotta would write a memoir about that pivotal time in history entitled, A Mighty Long Way, My Journey to Justice at Little Rock Central High School. A Mighty Long Way serves as a testament to the power of an individual and the profound effects one's actions and perseverance can have on both a community and our society as a whole. What's inspiring is to look at the whole span of Carlotta's life and her achievements and to see how a challenge can serve as a spark and how that adversity can be transformed into action and ingenuity and grace. After high school, Carlotta went on to earn a Bachelor's of Science degree from Colorado State College, which is now the University of Northern Colorado, and began working at the YWCA as a program administrator for teenagers. From there, she went on to found a real estate brokerage firm, Lanier & Company, in Denver, as well as the Little Rock Nine Foundation, a scholarship organization dedicated to ensuring equal access to education for African Americans, for which she serves as president. Carlotta has been recognized for many things in her life, including having been awarded the prestigious Spingarn Medal by the NAACP, and she has also been given the United States' highest civilian award the Congressional Gold Medal presented by Bill Clinton. This past October, Carlotta was also inducted into the United States National Women's Hall of Fame in Seneca Falls, New York. Looking back on her experience, Carlotta once said, referring to her diploma from Little Rock, I had to have that sheet of paper. It was an achievement. I helped change the educational system. It's one thing to hear that now from a wise, accomplished woman. It's another thing to look into the eyes of the young woman in that photograph and see that very same sense of purpose burning from the very beginning. Looking into the face of adversity and throwing her shoulders back and tucking her books up to her chest, striding up those stairs. 
If there is ever an example of someone who has looked adversity and the challenge squarely in the eye and said, I am all in to fight, it is our keynote speaker this afternoon, Carlotta Walls Lanier, and I hope you'll give, help join me in giving her a warm welcome to the stage. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction and this warm welcoming. This opportunity to speak to you this evening is, is quite an honor. Uh, however, I, what I want to start with will be a few words about you. First, this is, I understand, your 94th conference, which is to say, that your conferences have been around longer than most of us have been around. We may know somebody um, as old as your organization, but probably not too many. Now, how does this organization last this long? And you are older, of course, than the number of conferences that you have had. Established in 1901, this year makes you 115 years old. Now that's a lot of time and a lot of good. As an organization, you're one of the oldest, largest, and most effective women's volunteer organization in the world. I mean, that's, give it up, yes. Over 150,000 women in 291 leagues in four countries. Now this is a heritage which to be proud. And I'm glad that you clapped because I was gonna ask you to clap here. <laughs> For those who have come before you, you left the example which you are still following today. Most of us in this room do believe that the past matters. And I'm here to speak uh, of the past and the present in hopes that we can see, for all of us, a brighter future. Where have we been? Where are we now? Where do we want to go? Naturally, I cannot speak comprehensively, but I hope to tell a few stories that may be illuminating. I grew up in the South, in a place called Little Rock, Arkansas, and when I was younger than many of you, all white children, went to one school, and all black children went to another school. The school did not recognize any other skin color. In the eyes of the South, all school-aged children were either white or black. And your parents knew which you were and where you would go to school. As you know, this is called the segregated school system. And all Southern schools were segregated. Now, when I was in elementary school, Every week, we got a newspaper called The Weekly Reader. I always look forward to reading this newspaper that was written just for kids. <clears throat> in the spring of 1954, the headlines of The Weekly Reader in Lake May were about the unanimous passage of the Supreme Court case Brown versus Board of Education. A lawyer named Thurgood Marshall had argued persuasively for the end of segregated schools. He was up against a lawyer by the name of John Davis, who had argued before the Supreme Court over the most out of all attorneys, over 200 times in front of the Supreme Court. For Mr. Marshall, he had argued more, uh, no more than a dozen cases or so in the history of the Supreme Court. But, Mr. Marshall, who had argued those dozen cases, won this case. It was like David beating Goliath. We talked about this story in our classroom, what it might mean for us. Would we have the opportunity to go to any school we wanted to go to? 
How would this Supreme Court case change anything in our lives in Little Rock? So time passed and nothing changed. I still went to the all-black school and kids that I used to play ball with in the summertime still went to the all-white school. Yes, in the summertime, white and black kids played together in open fields. I lived on a street that was all black, the next street over was all white, and there was this open field in between. And uh, I like to let you know too that I was a pretty good softball player. <laughs> so I, I would get chosen and we would play and we played all summer long. And, and, and during those times, uh, some of the ball players, some of the white kids that I played with would talk about the new books that they were getting in the fall. And I was always happy for them because that meant that their books were moving over to my school. You see, I never had a new book to put my name in. I always had to add my name to five or six, seven other names that were in the book. So as I said, times just passed and, and nothing had really changed. These white kids that I played with in the summertime were great kids, uh, but we never went into each other's homes, each other's houses, and we never went to school together come fall. But when it was time for me to go to high school, things changed. Now that was 59 years ago, over a half a century. The high school in my neighborhood was a place called Central High School, but it was an all-white school. The black high school was called Horace Mann, and it was on the other side of town, about two to three miles away from Central. When I entered, Central was 30 years old when I was ready to go there. When it was first built, the American Architects Institute had voted it the most beautiful high school in America. That was 1927, built with $1.5 million. Uh, 1927, $1.5 million. And it, not only was it the most beautiful high school in, the, in America, it was the, uh, also academically one of the best high schools. It was in the top 40 in the country. In fact, at that time, it was ranked 34th in the country. And I'd like to just digress a little bit. About eight years ago when I was there, I witnessed a uh, commencement address, a graduation, and it was stated that they were 36 in the country, which really made me feel pretty good because after 50 some odd years, the fact that this school had been integrated for that long uh, stuck a pin in that idea that when you integrate a school that academically uh, it goes down. That's not the case. And, and that is uh, a testament to what is going on there in Little Rock Central High School. I wanted to be a doctor and I wanted the best education possible. So when I was asked in my ninth grade year in the spring of 1957, if I wanted to go to Central that fall, I immediately said yes. The sheet of paper came around the room. I signed the sheet of paper, gave it to the person behind me. This is in, at my junior high school, which was segregated. And um, it was in April of 1957. Signed that sheet of paper, didn't think another thing of it because you see, for three years, these plans were being put in place to, do, to integrate this school. But I, the type of person, when you say you're going to do something, I expect for it to be done rather quickly. Three years was not very quickly. I didn't even mention it to my parents when I went home. So that's how that whole process took place in, in the spring of 1957. And it was over 100 of us who signed a sheet of paper saying we wanted to go. But in the end, there were only nine of us who went. We didn't know each other as far as being close friends or anything of that nature, but I will assure you we became close friends. We just happened to be the ones who selected Central, and then Central in turn selected us. Now they checked us out, checked us out I'm assuming, for our grades, uh, our character, our behavior, 
checked us out for our families and our church going and community involvement. Today, I may call it the Jackie Robinson test. We might not have been the best African-American kids to integrate, but we were the selected ones, the ones that the school officials thought could handle whatever we might have to face. So what might have been a simple matter, the nine of us going to school at Central in the fall, facing more white faces than we could, uh, had ever seen together in our lives, uh, except on television or on the movie screen, became complicated because of Arkansas's worst governor ever got involved. <laughs> now, let me tell you, my parents voted for Alva Faubus the first two times he ran for office, but I can assure you, they didn't make that mistake ever again. <laughs> governor Faubus had been a moderate, in a moderate state at the time. He fell subject to the fierce pressure of the segregationists who convinced him that he may have a shot at a third term in the governor's seat if he had made a strong, if he make a strong stand against us entering the all-white central. Truth be told, being, uh, beyond being a governor, our fathers uh, didn't really know what to do with himself. So he sided with the segregationists and made that strong stand. He called out the Arkansas National Guard to ring the school to protect the citizens of Little Rock. That's what he said. Now, as my family watched him on television, I knew that I was a citizen, and I felt that the situation was going to be for all the citizens, black and white, against the troublemakers, the segregationist crowd, who became in the press the mobs and the thugs. I knew which side I was on, Faubus predicted that blood would run in the streets. Had I been more than 14 years old at the time, I might have been worried. But in my innocence, I might have thought, if pushed at the time, isn't Governor Faubus a thoughtful man? He wants to protect us from blood that will run in the street. That early September night, when I went to bed, I slept the last night of innocence of my life. Being an expert seamstress, my mother usually made all my clothes. But this was a special occasion. I was going to a new school. And at my school, we never thought of, at my house, we never thought of it or talked about it as a new white school. It was simply a new school. So my great uncle purchased me a new store-bought dress. He wanted me to have a store-bought dress. I think today he would realize that having an expert seamstress would probably be better than some of the things that we find in the stores today. <laughs> but he wanted me to have this to wear on my first day at school. Now my mother drove me to the corner where I was supposed to meet the other kids. And we were several blocks away from the crowd. But she was not worried because she saw some black ministers who were there to walk with us. In the care of God's ambassadors, there was nothing to fear. The head of the National Guard came over to our assembled group, addressed the white ministers, also there to support us, and told them that no Negroes would be permitted to enter Central that day. And you know what? I look at the pictures of us on that first day. I'm wearing my new store-bought dress. And in one of those photographs, um, I'm standing next to Ernie Green, who was Central High's first uh, black graduate. And I remember Ernie saying, what? You're not going to let us go to school? And I look at my face, and I'm in the 10th grade, you know, a low man on the totem pole. And I said, what? As though I was echoing Ernie. It was a moment of disbelief for me. I loved school. And here I was ready for school. And now I was not going to be permitted to go to school. I simply did not understand this message. Over the next two and a half weeks, which at the time were the longest weeks of my life, the nine of us met together at the home of Daisy Bates, who was the president 
of the Arkansas chapter of the NAACP. We went to court, we listened to the news on television, we read the morning paper, and we waited. On several occasions, something would happen, and I thought, well, this surely means that we're going to school tomorrow. But I was always wrong. Finally, the governor went north to Rhode Island, Providence, Rhode Island, to visit with the President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And we saw them come out of the meeting place together, smiling in the camera as though they had solved world hunger and made a path toward peace in our lifetime. Little did we know that they hadn't even made peace in Little Rock, but they smiled so big. And once again, I thought, now we will go to school. And I was learning a lesson. What you see, what you think, what is so obvious, what is so easy to believe will be, well, maybe not. Now I'll speed up the month of September 1957. The governor removed the guards, the Arkansas National Guard, and a few policemen, in fact, in the number of 17 of Little Rock's finest, were sent in to protect us or put, surround the school. On the morning of September 23rd, we entered the school for the first time. But a bomb threat, the mobs outside, which had grown to over a thousand, the fear of our lives, all caused us to be gathered up in the midst of our third class of the day and rapidly removed from the school. All America watched on television. So did the president, who said something like, what is happening in Little Rock? Because he had raised his hand and sworn to uphold the Constitution of the United States, President Eisenhower was disgusted by what he saw on television. And so he trumped the governor. He called out the country's military elite, the 101st Airborne Troopers, known as the Screaming Eagles. These were the heroes from World War II. They drove in, they flew in, they rolled into Little Rock. 1,200 soldiers from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. They showed up on September 24th that night to escort us into the school. So on September 25th, which is the day that we celebrate as our anniversary, 1957, the nine of us entered Central High for our first full day of school. We soon came to understand that getting into the school was only half the battle. It was a year like no other than the nine of us had ever seen. It was not just hard for us, it was especially hard for the parents who had lost their jobs, had to leave town to find work, who suffered because we were the first black students at Central. The other students in the school, or some of the other students in the school, weren't accepting of us either. They would have been pleased had we not gone to what they considered their school. It was a tough year, but challenges come into our lives so that we can learn lessons. Here are three of my learned lessons. I learned to hang in there until the job is done. I learned to trust myself and my own instincts first. I learned that there were others there for me, my parents, my church, my neighbors, the NAACP, the Urban League, and most of all, strangers from all over the world who sent letters of support through the mail. The nine of us entered Little Rock Central High School in the fall of 1957 might well be called the designated drivers of Brown versus Board of Education. We entered Central High School because nine white men in Washington, the justices of the Supreme Court, had decided that schools should be segregated, should be integrated, not to be segregated. It was our right to go to the public school in our neighborhood. In 2008, the Little Rock Nine were invited to attend Obama's inauguration as special guests. We had special seating along with the Tuskegee Airmen. 
as pioneers and survivors of what history now calls the Civil Rights Movement, the nine of us teenagers who made a simple declaration a half century ago. This is the school that we choose to go to. It is our right to do so. Stood witness to a seminal event in our country's history. Now I mention this because way back then, none of us could have predicted what would come to be. That America would elect, and by substantial numbers, its first African American president. And four years later, would return him to office again by substantial numbers. Yet, something has happened in our Congress. A Supreme Court justice dies, and the Republicans in the first quarter of the last year of President Obama's term announced that they will not meet with whomever the nominee will be. We all know about the repeated refusals to compromise, to work across the aisles. We also know that when such meetings take place, they are more likely to be among women who want to accomplish something. Most recently, the Treasury Department made a decision with votes from the American people to remove the slaveholder Andrew Jackson from the front of the $20 bill and replace him with Harriet Tubman, a black woman. who risked her life time and again to first get herself out of slavery and then return to lead others to freedom. Now, every time that $20 bill gets handed out, that, there is a reminder of an important part of our country's history. All that was built on the backs of slaves and how that great wrong needed to be corrected. A singular woman can remind us, of course, she was not alone. None of us who achieve anything is ever alone. Women have committed to play roles, everyday women in their jobs, in their various roles. Let's take example, uh, the example of a retired 20-year woman basketball coach at the University of Colorado. Her name is Seal Berry. And I heard her speak about two or three weeks ago. And she reported on this panel how she was ignored by the men in the department when she had uh, ideas on how to fix whatever problems they faced. Now here she is one of the top basketball coaches in America, now the assistant athletic director at the University of Colorado, a Hall of Famer, winning this basketball coach in the history of, Uni of University of Colorado, accustomed to her players doing as she instructed, but the decision makers that she is a part of were not listening. There are many divides among us today, race, gender, economic status. Many of our institutions are broken, the prisons, for both men and women. Uh, infrastructure, bridges, goals, uh, roads, subways and tunnels. Our police department, uh, departments where too many alarms go off about innocent men being shot down. And we have people running for the highest office in the land among the most powerful positions on the planet, President of the United States, who may be an embarrassment to us as a country and to us as fellow citizens. Now, now this reminds me of two short little stories. The granddaughter of mine uh, is in the second grade and she said to her mother a few months ago when the political campaigning got hot, it, in fact it was the International Women's Day and they were discussing uh, the women uh, in her classroom in the second grade uh, around the world who had these powerful positions. Uh, uh, Margaret Thatcher and Golda Meir and Butu and others. And this little second grader said, what, are you kidding me? 
there has never been a girl president of the United States? <laughs> and another friend who years back introduced her then young sons to a male doctor friend of hers, says so she had been taking her two sons to a, a female pediatrician. And after he walked away, after this male doctor walked away, the boys looked at their mother and said, are you kidding me? Boys can be doctors too? How about that? It is our work to make race, gender, economic divides less startling, to bring closer the divides. And in conclusion, clearly much progress has been made. How can we deny that? But we have much to do. Not one of us can sit it out. As Mother Teresa once said, and to paraphrase her, you don't have to do everything, but you have to do something. Even the smallest task undertaken with good consciousness can make a difference. Thank you for the work that you have done and the work that you will continue to do. Thank you very much. And I think it was Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. We do have some time for some questions. If anyone has a question for Carlotta, we'd ask you to please come to, I think there might be a, some of these mics set up here. Yeah. If not, shout real loud. And it's hard, it's hard to see you, so you might have to wave there your arms are. a bit. There's one. Okay. I think that it is, uh, it's a very good question. Um, it needs to be put on the table. It needs to be talked about in a non-confrontational way. I think that that is the biggest problem. Uh, too many of us come with these uh, ideas that it has to be a certain way, and you're, you're talking to people with closed ears, um, and, it, and it, it's the approach that is taken. But it does need, it's the elephant in the room, talk about it. That, that, that is how I see it. Yes. Thank you so much. It is such an inspiration to see you in person. Thank you. I'm happy to be here <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> My, question, <laughs> My question is about um, women. We have such a topic of the woman card. And what are some things that all of us can do to articulate the importance of what women bring to the table without this sort of whiny thing that often we get attributed to? I, I understand that perception that we do have, unfortunately, um, and most of that comes from the male side anyway. Um, <clears throat> but it is, it is the way that, um, that, that we talk to other people. It really is. Um, we are passionate about what we stand up to uh, or are concerned about. Uh, I think our biggest thing is to teach our young ones um, what's right and, and, and also give them the opportunity to learn about other people, other communities, um, where they stand. Uh, I speak to a lot of uh, uh, students, the bullying in many forms is, is just running rampant. And we need to understand how to uh, talk to our kids to have them to stand up and be supportive of that person who is being bullied however they are being bullied. And even if it means just telling an adult or telling someone else who is in a more powerful position to, um, to take note of these things. We are losing young people to suicidal, uh, all of these areas that uh, we didn't hear about years ago, but they can't take it. And they are not, um, <laughs> as I tell the, the, the college students when they ask these sort of questions, is that they got to know who they are. They need to be centered, 
know who they are, and then they are able to go forward in whatever direction that they are interested in. Um, I, I have a young sister, my youngest sister, <coughs> retired. Um, I think she was a little over, fifth, uh, about 55, I guess, when she did retire uh, from a large corporation. She was senior vice president of Philip Morris, and she had worked her way uh, up to that position. And I know what she went through in trying to get her points across, and, and she had to tone down the way she spoke in these various meetings and so forth because she was so passionate about whatever it was, especially on the governmental level. So it, it, it's the approach that we take, and if we bring um, uh, facts, uh, it, it's easier for them to accept, and when I say them, those who are just totally against us, uh, but in, in a nice conversation, one-on-one -on -one, a lot of times, we'll get that person who is in power to start changing their direction in, in how they think about um, whatever particular subject that you're, you're on. But we do need to do that. And um, that whining part is, is being stated. And, and I know that my, my youngest sister used to tell me how some others uh, in her position that were females were not being listened to because they thought that that was the approach they were taking. So you, you, sometimes you have to be that a, a little bit tougher with the boys in the room. So that's just the way it goes, unfortunately. Now that one I can't hear, <laughs> but um, sorry. Um, I would love to know your opinion on the whole Target bathroom debate. On the whole what? Target bathroom debate. Oh, the bathroom debate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's all over Facebook. Thanks. You know, um, <clears throat> well, I do feel that, <laughs> and I just watched the basketball game last night, so I, I guess that's what's on my mind right now. That. The All-Star Game is going to be held in North Carolina, and they are the ones who came up with this. And I think, I think you, you hit the people in the pocket. <laughs> uh, when, when they're not getting the revenue, then they stop and think about what they have just done. Uh, I, I, in Europe, there's no problem. So why is it a problem here? Why is it that we are so... It, ingrained in doing it one way. You know, changes take place. Other places in our, our world, they're able to deal with the situation with no problems. And um, I, I also saw a little bit of that on the TV this morning um, ab about the marketing of, of underwear and so forth and, and, and how this is opening it up to uh, pedophiles and so forth. You know, we, we've taken it to the extreme and we have to be more aware and more secure-minded in ourselves and know who we are and how, how we are to handle that when we go into a particular room. I think it is great that we have already taken a step in this country by having a bathroom that's unisex with where, where you can take your babies in and, and change their diapers and so forth, or at the swimming pool where they can change into their swimming uh, attire. The men come in with their daughters or, or their sons or what have you and be able to do that. So I think we just have to find a way and then stop being so negative about these things. Uh, I think that we look at a, a glass half empty instead of half full. And I, I think we need to start rethinking how we approach uh, this, but I, I do think that um, North Carolina might rethink this whole thing if the NBA All-Star Game is not held there next year, because that's a lot of money coming into that state. <laughs> there you are. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. As an Atlantan, we welcome you to Atlanta. Well, thank you. No problem. Um, 
my question is, we talk about race and gender, and how do you evolve the conversation for impactful inclusivity when you start adding the dynamic of class and socioeconomic challenges and segregation? Well, you include them, and you also learn the differences of class and where they are coming from. When you are a part of various committees and boards and so forth, um, I think that that <clears throat> gives you an opportunity. First of all, if you ask to be on it, you bring something to the table, I do believe. So you have that that you are bringing to the table and you are listening, hopefully, to the others that are coming to this table to understand that everything is not all about where, where you reside, whether you reside in a wealthy community or a middle class community or a lower class community, you get to understand the others. Ladies, we have to have an open mind. We really do. Change is taking place every minute of the day. And we have to take this information in, absorb it, and put it in the right place, or the best place that we individually can do, uh, to do our personal best in whatever it is. But yes, we do have to take that information in. Those, the people in, in other um, social economic levels have rights just as you do. And you have to understand from where they are coming from and why it is that way. Look how long it has taken for them to recognize, the, although they didn't take Andrew Jackson off altogether, so that's fine, but they just put him in the back, that's all. <laughs> and, and black people have been in the back a long, long time. <laughs> so now there is a woman on the front, and, uh, and I, I think that's great. So it, these are the sort of changes that have to take place in our society and, and, and w will be taking place more and more each day. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, well, there's one more, I think. <laughs> oh, two more, all right. <laughs> Thank you again, Ms. Lanier, for your comments and your perspective. Mm -hmm. I had a question in light of the divisiveness of society, of politics that you referenced today. What is the thing that gave you resilience when you were younger in an equally divisive time? And what is the thing today that gives you hope um, about the future where folks can come together a little bit more um, and tear each other down less? You know. I, I'm fortunate. My parents never taught me to hate. And, and I, I do believe all of this starts at home, okay? Uh, and then it is reinforced in the classroom, on the playgrounds, or what have you. Uh, I, I uh, was able to uh, persevere, I think, because of what I knew was right uh, that had been taught to me by my, my parents, my family, my church going. Uh, my community, and, and knowing that even though I sat on the back of the bus or in the balcony of a theater or could only go to the zoo on a certain day as if the animals knew the difference, the color of my skin. <laughs> now you figure that one out. Um, I knew I was just as good as the next person, okay? And that came from my teaching from home. And I think we need to do that now, today, with our young people, with your, your children, with your nieces, your nephews, your, your, your grandchildren, whatever. We need to start from, that, that's where it needs to start. And I am hopeful by the young people that I, I come in contact with in the various schools uh, and, and universities. Uh, they're so much brighter than, than uh, most people 
think they are. Um, you know, technology is such where they're just learning so much uh, so quickly, I guess. But I am hopeful with our young people. But what I want us to do is to mentor these young ones. Mentoring is very important. Now, for me, when I came along, I listened to the older people. See, I came along during the time you could be seen, but you couldn't say anything, OK? But today, young people do speak. They are able to speak out. And we need to help train them as to how to question certain things. And, and so they can be heard um, without uh, uh, the, the rioting type mentality. They need to be included into committees, uh, into uh, action that is taking place in the community. You can find them in the YWCA. You can find them in the schools. You can find them in the YMCA, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, whatever. There are young people who want to be heard. And I think that if you can help guide them by being a mentor, and if you own a business, and, and, and there, there's some interest in a person who wants to know about that business, bring them in in some form or fashion, whether it's a part-time on Saturday or part-time after school or what have you, and help teach them how to, to run whatever it is that you might have. There are many, many ways that we can give back uh, without it being such a grand scale thing. It really is, and it's appreciated. Uh, it's appreciated in so many ways. And I'm going to give you another quick story about that. I spoke to a group, prep, uh, a junior high school group back in the uh, 80s. And the 50th anniversary took place in 2007. And I had spoken in this middle school in Denver, Colorado in, in the 80s, as I said. And in 2007, I received a phone call from a young man in New York who was a teacher or professor at a university. And he thanked me. Um, he, he was so pleased that it was the 50th anniversary. And he said, I want to tell you that I heard you in the eighth grade at Place Middle School in Denver, Colorado. And it just changed my life. And he said, I want to let you know that I am the professor here, and I can't remember the name of the university. Um, and I am over uh, uh, Black History Month activities and have been for the past 10 or 12 years. And he said, and I'm a white guy. And that really made me feel good, that I had touched someone in the eighth grade who had gone from there to give back to other young people as he grew older and, and you know, making changes for other young people that he is touching on that particular campus. So you never know what your actions um, can, can do for those uh, that you are around. And, and so just, just take a little extra time to help some other young person or get them involved, whether it's politics or whether it's nonprofit or whether it, whatever it is. Whatever your passion is, there are others that will come behind you, and you need to be that catalyst for them to, to give back in that particular arena. Thank you very much. It has been an honor. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Coyo Munoz from the Junior League of Mexico City. Oh, okay. I just <laughs> wanted to ask you, due to the late, latest um, political storm in the United States, there have been a range against some foreign people in the United States. How do you suggest to control that wave of hate that has um, aroused in some areas of this beautiful country? 
Well, I know that you are, I'm assuming you are participating in your, well, you're in Mexico, is that it? And your concern yes, is the, the uh, rhetoric of immigration considerations here in the United States. Is that, that is our yes. next biggest civil rights issue here in this country. And this country was built on immigrants. And, it, it, you know, we live in this beautiful country because of others coming here, uh, because they were being denied so many other things in their country. And you have a right. I have spoken to the dreamers that have, I, I, I feel for them because they were brought here, they were born here, and their parents were from somewhere else. And it, they have a right. They are going to college. They're trying to graduate. They're trying to uh, get into the society of, of, of our American uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, environment. And they are afraid. And it's unfortunate that they are afraid. They need to get with wherever state that they're in with their representation. Uh, their congressman, and and to see whatever type of help that they can get, because there are some uh, some states that are really helping some of the immigrants, and it, it, I've had a, a number of uh, scholarship winners who were afraid to leave Colorado to go to Arkansas just to receive their scholarship, and uh, because they thought that they would be deported. And these kids are great kids. They're just like your children, um, doing well in school and want to be a part of this great society. And we need to embrace them. We need to encourage them to speak up and find someone who is their mouthpiece, basically, in their states. So it's really about the states. And I, I don't know all the particulars between our two countries in, in coming from one side to another. But we, we would prefer it to be legal. Everyone prefers that. But unfortunately, in some situation, it is some illegal immigration that's going on. But they need to find the right people on this side to get with to, to protect them during, during that particular um, environment. Thank you. Carlotta, I want to take you back to the past for a minute sure. and ask you, as a 14-year-old young girl, did you ever fear in those first few weeks? Did you fear for your life? Did you fear for whatever? And if so, what got you through? Mm -hmm. And did you ever get pressure from your parents to give up? To give up, no. Well, first of all, I, I feel... I'm going to preface this by saying that the real heroes and sheroes of our time were really the parents. They are the ones who really, um, really suffered. Because if you, as a, and I didn't really understand that until I, I became a parent, um, when you uh, see your kid go off to school and those things are taking place. Whether you want to allow them to go back the next day. I, as I said before, I was not taught to hate. And I did not have the fear on that first day. There was no fear for me. Yes, I saw that crowd across the street. I heard their uh, language. I heard their fear, uh, I felt their fear uh, of the unknown. And I, I really feel that that's what it was because they had, they thought someone else was coming into their space that, that didn't look like them. And the words didn't bother me. Uh, I, I considered them, and, and this is how I got through. I stayed above what I was hearing and what I was feeling. I had to stay above it. I considered them very ignorant people. And that's what was going through my head, that they did not understand that I had a right 
to be there. Uh, the Supreme Court justices had given me that right. The law said I had a right. And this country was built on laws. And that's what I had been taught all along. So I didn't hate them. I also got to the place where I felt sorry for them. But at the same time, I stayed above it. Um, I ignored their ignorance as best I possibly could. We had been told by the superintendent of schools, of that 100, as I spoke about earlier, 39 had been uh, asked to come and sit before the superintendent of schools. And he gave us a litany of things that we could and could not do. And you will read this in my book. I could not uh, participate in any curricular, extracurricular activity. Now mind you, for all these years prior to the 10th grade, that was what I was being taught at home, that you did well in school, you participate in extracurricular activity at school, you give back in your community, and that helps to make you a well-rounded citizen. And I was doing that. I had been captain of my basketball team, captain of the cheerleading team, vice president of the girls' council and student body and, and National Honor Society. And when I heard the superintendent say you could not do any of that, then I adjusted. And I said, well, I'm in the 10th grade, first year in high school. I can do that for one year. But I'm sure by the time I'm in the 11th grade, that these other things will open up for us. But we could not participate in the band, in sports, in the working on the yearbook or the newspaper or a student council, any of that. All we could do was go to school every day and leave the campus at 3.30 and not return to the next morning. We couldn't even go to the basketball and football games and support our school and our school spirit which I wanted to do, because that's what I did in my other school. So I had to readjust, realign my thoughts, and I did that easily. But the, the fear, the, the worst day was that September 23rd for me, and also the day that my home was bombed were my, my worst fearful days there at Little Rock Central High School. But I was able to persevere, uh, get through it. God only gives you what you can bear. That was the thoughts that were going through my mind. So that's how I made it. And um, I, I, I still go back to what I tell young people today, get to know who you are and whose you are because those people that have uh, brought you into this world and have taught you hopefully good values uh, will carry you much further into this world than you ever know. So that's my story. And I'm sticking to it. Carlotta, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us here today. I don't know about you guys, but I actually got goosebumps a couple times during her remarks. And I loved what she was talking about with challenges are really there to help you learn lessons. And really appreciated your talking about how, remember that others are there to support you. When all of us go back to our communities and we, and we get all in on the issues that we're fighting on, there's gonna be times that are tough. But remember, there's 800 women in this room who are there to support you. And there's all the members of your league that are there to support you in your fight in your community. You'll be happy to know that AGLI has, will be providing a copy of Carlotta's book, A Mighty Way, uh, or Mighty Long Way, no, to all of the conference delegates. And inside on the front page, there will be a book plate which she has signed. And yes, she has signed all 800. So those, yep. <laughs> So to those who complain about signing a couple appeals letters back home, mm, no. 
Um, if you'd prefer a more personal inscription, Carlotta will actually be outside of the ballroom in the exhibit area, signing books and taking photos. And now just a little bit of logistics for this evening. She will also be joining us at the opening reception tonight at the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. And we really can't think of a better opportunity to share history with someone who is such an integral part of it. Transportation to the opening reception is available leaving the hotel at 6.30 with continuous shuttles back and forth until the end, departing two floors down from here on the international level, and there will be signs guiding you along the way. So thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you tonight at the opening reception. Thank you.